thank you so much, everyone, for um, allowing us to present today to the Bipartisan Women's Caucus, who has a long history of actually amazing accomplishments for women and women's health. We're so happy to have this opportunity and your time. And thank you to Jamie and Ashanti for sharing their personal and powerful stories. Jamie and Ashanti have told us the story of one person, two people, and as we go forward, I want to say I have a very fortunate opportunity where I'm a psychologist, so I do speak one-on-one, -on -one and I hear those one-on-one -on -one stories, and I'm a researcher, so I survey, along with my colleagues, sometimes 500,000 people, and it's amazing how these these data points align, and we need to hear from the one person because it really can move us as humans as to how people can be affected. And we need to know from the hundreds of thousands or the millions what kind of impact we're working with so that we can move forward for women living with these chronic illnesses. I want to speak real briefly in my time about what life has been like during the pandemic not only the challenges, but opportunities, and what we can do to move forward in a positive way following the pandemic and keep the positive waves going forward. So migraine and ME-CFS share several things. They're both invisible illnesses. Everyone looks great, everyone looks fine, you look fine. Uh, one of the most frustrating things that people living with these illnesses can hear, they can both be terribly disabling. Jamie and Ashanti both told us about losing careers that they worked so hard to achieve and that mattered to them, that supported their families, that were passions of theirs. They're costly diseases to individuals, as we just heard, we heard Ashanti's story. That is an incredible cost. Uh, and to society, both direct costs, like what the medications, what the treatment costs, and indirect costs. How much productivity did they both lose? How much income would they have made? These diseases are both under-recognized, under-diagnosed, way under-diagnosed, under-treated, and underfunded in research, as Dr. Joanna Kempner told us, and we can talk a little bit more about in Q&A, terribly underfunded compared to the proportion of individuals and how profoundly they affect people. Migraine, real quick, a billion people around the world live with migraine. That's 30 million American women, three to one women to men. It's most frequent, common, severe, in midlife, those years of productivity, the years where you are going to school, where you're maybe having a relationship, maybe having babies, caring for children, caring for aging parents, women we know care for everybody. This is the time, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, these busy decades when it's so disabling and the World Health Organization confirmed it is the most disabling disease on the planet among people from 15 to 49 years old. MECFS up to an estimated two and a half million Americans live with ME-CFS, mostly women. Um, and again, it is most disabling in that busy midlife time, the time when Ashanti wants to be nursing, not sitting in the hospital receiving an infusion, the time when Jamie should be at work, working and caring for her family. They should both be at their kids' sports games. This is when you wanna live your life and when society expects and demands the most of women. Society relies on women. They are the core fabric that holds all of us together. Mothers, partners, teachers, educators, nurses, health providers, providers for aging parents. We need women. We need them and we need to care for them. These diseases affect more than the person with the disease. They affect partners. They affect children parents, employers, co-workers, friends. They affect our communities and our families, our teams and organizations, employers. They affect our entire American culture. And that's why it's so important to think about how can we support women living with these chronic illnesses? Well, on top of living with a chronic debilitating illness, 300 years of systematic racism that has resulted in racial violence all the time, including this year, that resulted in um, widespread protests. On top of all of that, we have a pandemic. So now, not only are people living with all of that, we have a pandemic with a virus which actually 
uh, enhances both symptoms of migraine and headache and fatigue. And as it was so eloquently pointed out, ME-CSF may be a component of post-COVID-19 long COVID syndrome. We may be seeing what numbers of new people joining this patient community of this underfunded, undertreated, underdiagnosed, under-researched disease that currently has no FDA-approved treatments. Um, in addition, several migraine comorbidities are risk factors for COVID-19 catching the disease, and to put it bluntly, are risk factors for death or morbidity. Um, in addition, people of color, as Ashanti read out those important statistics, are much higher risk of not only contracting COVID-19, as well as dying from it. Again, I'm being blunt. I could say morbidity and mortality. No, let's talk about death. These are real people. My hospital's in the Bronx. 4,000 people in my hospital's neighborhood have died already in months from this disease. And it's disproportionately people of color and people with comorbidities such as these two diseases we're talking about. Indirect effects. So, you know, we have a terrible number of people who've had COVID-19. And whether you've had it or not, everyone in the country and around the world is living together with all of these ripples that come from this pandemic. Disruption to medical care, disruption to mental health care. Um, some of the treatments that Jamie and Ashanti both talked about are in-person treatments. Ashanti is in the hospital as we speak. Thank you, Ashanti. For being here um, getting an infusion. Jamie needs to go see a provider for trigger point injections, for nerve blocks, for Onabot, which is Botox for chronic migraine that some people use. Um, there are things that need to happen in person. Now, those were not possible for some months, and our medical teams across the country um, scrambled, and our hospitals and our health set settings tried to figure out how to get the care we need for people, including, you know, running down to people's cars in the parking lot to give them what they needed, all sorts of things. People have just pivoted to come together to care for people. Um, financial and occupational consequences. These are groups of, of people living with these conditions who already may be underemployed or unemployed, already may be disabled with major financial medical costs and no income coming in. And now we've added this additional burden of loss of incomes, maybe loss of incomes to partners, maybe loss of, of jobs for people who are in um, service industries, which, which really are in-person sorts of service industries, teaching and, and, and being a server and all of those kinds of in-person essential industries, people are so hit financially. School and academic consequences, things going on hiatus um, for who knows how long. Those who are currently employed and can work from home, who's only some percentage, pivoting to work from home, well, we know there's little ones at home, little kids at home. I mean, I can't believe no one's walked through my door yet, but don't be surprised if we have a toddler running at any minute and make a cameo appearance. Social isolation, stress, increase in migraine attack frequency, MECFS symptoms and flares, and either exacerbation or new onset of existing anxiety, depression, insomnia, acute stress disorder, PTSD, weight gain, sleep disorders, as well as some people who may not have had COVID-19 themselves, but have had family members who, who, who die. Lifelines during the pandemic, what has been good? Telehealth. Now, Jamie talked about already having some limited telehealth. And as we heard earlier, every state is a little bit different. One thing that's been good is that during this crisis, um, our, our government came together to lift some of our current limitations and telehealth, whether it's web, phone or other, or mobile health applications have been incredibly well received. Um, uh, these are folks who a lot of times um, even pre-pandemic would have a hard time getting to an appointment, getting dressed and up and out when they feel terrible. Um, and this really lifts the burden so that people can get the mental and the psychological or uh, physical and the mental health care they need. So telehealth has been a real positive thing during this pandemic. Um, in addition to insurers that did temporarily lift some of the usual restrictions, that's been helpful. 
for people who are working and who have jobs that you can work remotely, work or school from home has actually eliminated some of the more rigid time expectations. People have talked about getting more sleep in the morning, not having to get up quite so early to get dressed and get their kids to school, and that's a good thing for people with migraine or ME-CFS. Um, so that flexibility has been good. And the virtual support advocacy and education that's happened has just been beautiful. Um, in the migraine community, um, patient education advocacy groups have created wonderful online um, education and support, Miles for Migraine and the Coalition for Headache and Migraine Patients, the American Migraine Foundation and, and National Headache Foundation have done wonderful online programs, all sorts of creative connections. So I like that in the midst of this dark storm, there have been some silver linings of coping that is working and helpful. And how can we continue this into the future? How can we support this large population living with migraine and or ME-CFS? Well, we can support continued flexibility in medical care. Several people this morning mentioned the House Telehealth Caucus Bill and um, both of our, our eloquent speakers, uh, Ashanti and Jamie, talked about how important and beneficial that is in their care. Um, when possible, continue to support work flexibility, whether it's telecommuting, flexible or asynchronous work schedules. And of course, you know, we can't forget that a lot of women do have children. Well, a lot of childcare and school situations, especially this year, may be closed or virtual. We really have to think about how to continue to support people, especially women, um, but both all parents in childcare. Um, Jamie told such a powerful story about her really challenging experiences with disability um, and want to think about the disability reform bill that Jamie mentioned and outlined. And um, we heard Dr. Kepner, actually both of our doctors, uh, are first off talk about that um, the NIH funded research for these diseases are vastly underrepresent the both frequency and burden with which we have them and experience them in the American society. So our lessons, what were our challenges, what are our opportunities? Well, both of these diseases disproportionate, disproportionately affect women, especially in midlife. This is a time when we expect so much of women, when women give so much to society, a time of productivity, responsibilities, and caregiving. The pandemic placed an even greater burden on these challenges, especially for women living with these diseases as well as women of color and creative barriers to medical care. But telehealth and other types of flexibility are very helpful and it would benefit this large segment of our U.S. population to carry these solutions into the future. So just to end on the note before we go to our Q&A that we all know women are essential in our society and supporting women with chronic illnesses benefits everyone. Not only does it benefit them, it benefits all of our society and it's really the right thing to do. So we really wanna to work together to move forward in supporting women and creating positive change for people living with both of these diseases. Thank you.